today we've asked Daniel Walter if he'll read the scripture for us. So we're going to get the microphone to him, and Daniel will be reading the text and sharing a few words with us before we go into the preaching from scripture. Everyone again turning to Acts chapter 26, starting at verse 1. Thank you. 
the Acts of the Apostles, part of the things that they've done, and Paul would have done them in character and story, but Paul would be the first to say that Paul's name is for furtherance of the gospel. For Paul, he was allowed to preach before in this situation, before the most important man in the king of these nations. the entire religion was built for is to look forward to the appearing of Christ. And he had missed that, obviously. And he was allowed to preach through a woman who had always a reputation of such a good woman. His father was a man. And then he went to preach John the Baptist to that. So there's not perfect family history of the real leaders. Paul starts out by establishing his credibility as a leader. said in a loud voice, which means it's popular with Seth. Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great mind is driving you out of your mind. Um, and you can infer from that that Paul would be beginning to see the comfort of the old friend Seth. And so maybe he would agree with him, maybe, or have him saying five hundred kiss lines about how he would live in his life and the Holy Spirit is helping him out in his boldness. But you know, he's mentally you're out of your mind. Thank you. 
briefly pray and then go right into the text. Our Lord, help us to have the hearing ears to hear, and we pray that there be the peace that you bring through your Holy Spirit that can rest over this entire congregation, over this auditorium, so that we would be able to have appropriate focus on you and your truth. And we pray finally that the impact of the words that are preached would draw not only us closer to the Lord, but would take some who are here and bring them to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Our sermon series is called Evangelism, the Holy Spirit, and the Early Church. We'll put that slide on the screen right now. Recent chapters of this book of Acts have centered on the arrest and of the trials of the Apostle Paul. Paul went to Jerusalem, as you remember, to bring a financial gift to suffering Christians who were there. Paul was arrested. He was accused of a lot of false things, and he was accused of one true thing. He was accused of being a Christian. During two years in prison, Paul was put through trials twice and was found guilty of nothing through that time, although they were unwilling to let him go either because they didn't want to rile some of the Jewish accusers. At last... Paul said, I appeal to Caesar, meaning to say, these continuous trials where I'm still being found guilty of nothing, but I'm not being released, have caused me to believe that the best job now is to appeal to the highest governor, the highest judge of the entire empire. That would be Caesar Nero. I appeal to Caesar. So one more interview is scheduled before Paul was to be shipped off to Rome to face Caesar. The purpose of this last meeting wasn't really a court trial. The purpose of this last meeting instead was so that the local officials could figure out what to write down on the paperwork that they sent to Nero. They say, we haven't yet quite figured out what the big uproar is about. Let's try one more time. Let's especially get a Jewish local king, a man named Agrippa, to hear this thing and so that he could get some advice about what to put down about why Paul was being transferred to Nero's court. Present at this meeting were the following. Governor Festus, this is really his place, and he is the one who is officiating over this. With him is King Agrippa, and he actually turns over the proceedings to Agrippa and says, Agrippa, you've been around here for a long time. Why don't you run this meeting a little bit and we can figure out what to say about Paul. Next to Agrippa is Agrippa's royal sister, Bernice. Also, all the high-ranking Roman military officers. So many of them were there at Caesarea, and they all crowded to see. This was a spectacle. They all wanted to see what was going on. It tells us the leading men of the city were all there. And finally, also, there was Paul. Paul, in chains, as a prisoner, he is going to be questioned, and he is going to make a statement just heard a moment ago. Here's what happens. We start with Paul discussing things about his early life, beginning at verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motions with his hand to indicate that he's going to begin, and he begins to tell something about what he wants to say as his defense. Paul says the following, verse 2, King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today and make this defense against the accusations of the Jews, 
especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. He says, you, Agrippa, are fairly well qualified to understand this because you've lived amongst us Jews, unlike the Romans who um, come and go and don't really understand us. You understand these things, and I want you to be able to hear what I have to say. And so now, in the hearing of everyone, Paul gives a full account of his conversion. It's really his testimony. Everyone catch this. He's going to give his testimony to all the people listening. And he is King Agrippa, and it is Governor Festus, and it is all of these Roman officers and all of these local dignitaries and all the people who crowded in to see this. He's got an audience. I mean, he's the one in chains, but he's got a captive audience. They're all there, and he's going to tell them all his testimony. What he shares is going to be similar to what you and I have already heard back in chapter 9, where it says, this is how Paul became a Christian. And it's going to be similar to what Paul said in front of a crowd of people in a chapter, chapter 22, when he gave his testimony to a lot of people. And now we're hearing the same kind of material again. And you stop and think for a minute. There's a limited number of pages in the Bible. There's certainly a limited number of pages in the book of Acts. There's certainly a lot of things that God wants to include in this. Why do we get Paul's testimony over and over and over again? I think it tells us several things. Listen to this. Paul apparently gave his testimony often. God wanted us to see that Paul gave his testimony often. People are attracted to hearing a life's story. Do you know that? They want to hear what happened in this person's life. It is something that is compelling for people. Testimonies have power. Your testimony has power. One of the lies that Satan will bring to you is he'll say, well, other people's testimony has power because their life was interesting. But my life was just my life. Well, your life is interesting beyond what you think. And I can demonstrate that to you fairly easily. In our church, what we do is we get people who are going to be baptized, and they, before their baptism, each one of them gives a testimony. This is how I came to know Christ as Savior. And these are the changes that Jesus has made in my life. These are the greatest services our church has. People in our church and the relatives and unsaved neighbors and others of the ones getting baptized, they all pile in. And they hear these testimonies one after another and say, that was fantastic. That was amazing. Listening to those life stories, that was the greatest thing. Those testimonies have power. There is spiritual power in them. And Paul gave his testimony over and over again, probably far more times than three times. You understand this. But God uses these three times to demonstrate this, that Paul often gave his testimony. Testimonies have power. God intends for you to share your testimony often. It's your best evangelistic tool. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses. You're going to go out and witness about what I've done in your life. I have this question for you. When was the last time you shared your testimony? You might say, well, let me think about that. For a few here, it may have been as recently as yesterday. For others, you'd say, I don't remember when is the last time I shared my testimony? This is something that the Lord says is a powerful tool. It's compelling for others to hear. The Apostle Paul frequently shared his testimony when he's confronted with this very, very important official occasion. Rather than saying, and Daniel pointed this out very well to us a minute ago, rather than going through a lot of legal argumentation, rather than trying to explain how he didn't do what they accused him of doing, what did he do? He gave his testimony. He said, this is what God's done in my life. Let me walk this out with you. When is the last time you shared your testimony? Paul starts all the way back to the very beginning from his early childhood. Verse 4. The Jews all know the way that I've lived ever since I was a child. That word for child means a really, really, really young child. From the beginning of my life in my own country, at first he was raised in another land outside of Israel to a Jewish family, and then also in Jerusalem. Later, as a teen, he came to Jerusalem, and he was trained under the authority of the greatest Jewish teacher of that day. They have known me for a long time. 
He says, the chief priests and these accusers have known me since I got into town as a teenager, and I began advancing rapidly in the ranks of the Jewish faith. They can testify if they're willing that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. He says, I'm not somebody who was living in opposition to Jewish faith. I was living according to the strictest norms of Jewish faith. I was stricter than most. And now it's because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise the 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night, O king. He says, listen, there is a promise of a Messiah who will deliver us from our sins. The 12 tribes of Israel have been living according to waiting on that promise, waiting for that Messiah. They are living according to that. He says, all my Jewish brothers are still waiting for that Messiah to come. I am being accused based on my hope in that Messiah, but the difference that I have is that I believe that Messiah already came. That one was Jesus Christ. I am putting my faith in him. The Jews are still hoping to see it fulfilled, but I had this hope fulfilled. It was Jesus. He died. He rose again. And as Paul would say, the rest of the story I'm going to give you is going to explain why I think that this is a valid thing for me to believe. It is because, O king, and I'm here in verse, what, 7. It's because of this, O king, because of this hope that the Jews are accusing you. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Now, I've got to stop and say a word about this. I was talking about this with one of my children last night. And he said, my son said, well, I think it's pretty incredible that God raises the dead. And then I realized, okay, we're not using the same language here. Uh, when Paul says, why should any of you think it is incredible, the literal meaning of that, of course, is not credible, not believable, not true. Why do you think that it's not possible for God to raise the dead? Do you think that it is incredible that God could do this? It is credible. It's something God does. On the other hand, in the way we use it, it is kind of incredible that God raises it. I understand that. But Paul says, you all, I believe that we have a Messiah. I believe that he died, and I believe he rose again. I'm going to tell you about that in just a minute. And I don't want you to think that that isn't possible. I want you to understand it is possible. And so he starts with his early life, and then he talks about the events that came immediately before his salvation, starting at verse 9. I, too, was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. What he means to say is, you've heard about my young life, now I'm getting to the point where I was an adult. I got to be a very responsible adult, and I became one of the Jewish leaders myself. And I thought it was necessary to do everything I could to expose as a complete fraud and a fake this thing about Jesus of Nazareth. I decided I would give my full energy to opposing it. He says the following. That's what I did in Jerusalem, verse 10. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, oh, this is the wrong picture here, Tiger. We were supposed to have the other slides. All right. So let's see. John, if you're there, why don't you see if you can help out what David needs to do there. And uh, so we'll go on for a moment here. He says here, this is what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. He says, I went from one synagogue to the next. And I would roust out any Christians that I would find. And I would arrest them. And I would drag them off. And I would torture and imprison them for a while. And then when there was a vote, and when we had a big vote about whether they were going to be killed or not killed, of course, what I did is I voted to have them killed. In fact, I was part of the gang that killed Stephen, for example. When it was time for Stephen to be put to death, I killed him. That, that, I was right there with him. He's saying, if you want to know my background, I was on the side of these people who are accusing me now. I was doing all of this myself against them. I tried to force them to blaspheme, verse 11. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. He says, I would bring them in and I'd torture them. And I would torture and persecute them for a while. And then I would tell them, I might let you go if you say that you don't believe in Jesus. And if you will blaspheme and say wrong things against Jesus, then I might let you go. He said, I did all of it. 
And I wasn't content to do that just in Israel, but I would even go further than that. I would go to other cities in other countries. In just a minute, he's going to tell about how he went to a place in Syria called Damascus. And he said, I would take up that against rulers who lived there. I would do anything I could to oppose this message about Jesus. And I want to briefly tell you something. Testimonies are meant to have three parts to them. I realize there's variations to everything I'll say, but in general, testimonies have three parts. When you stand up in front of a group of people or you're just sharing with somebody over a cup of coffee about your testimony, it normally has three parts. First, what was happening in your life before you came to know Jesus as Savior? That's the part that Paul is talking about right now. Paul is saying, before I became a believer, these are the things that were going on in my life. This is what I believed. This is what the deal was. Second, how you came to know Jesus as Savior. What exactly happened that brought you to know Jesus as your Savior? That's important. Let me pause for just a moment. If you tell people, these are the things that were happening in my life before I became a Christian, and then I met Jesus, my life has changed. Did that tell people how it is that you met him or how they could trust him too? Did that tell them? No, you sort of breathed right past that as if they knew. Then I got saved, and then all of my life was different. Well, I'm so glad that the one hearing this says, I don't know how that happened. What happened? The cool thing about the Apostle Paul's testimony is not only did he say, this is what happened before, but he always then lingers over, this is what happened the day I got saved. These are the things that happened to me. And then finally, there is in the testimony, this is what happened since I came to know Jesus as Savior, because if it's genuine, there will be a changed life. If it's genuine, your life will not be the same as what it once was. And Paul tells what happened since he came to know Jesus as Savior. He will tell all of these things. Going back to the text, starting here at verse 12. On one of those journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and permission of the chief priests. He was going there to torture and persecute Christians. About noon, midday, O king, I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, that's his, his kind of hometown language that he would normally speak, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The speaker is Jesus. Jesus says, in persecuting Christians, you are persecuting me. When you stand against my people, you stand against me. And you may say, wow, Paul's been, or Saul's been, Saul, now it's Paul. It was having some effect. He was really, you know, doing some things against Jesus. Jesus said, it's actually the opposite way around. Jesus is cornering Saul. He's been causing one person after another to give Saul the truth. I'm Stephen spoke a long thing all about faith in Jesus Christ, and then Saul was involved in killing him. Others would have spoken about Jesus Christ, and then Saul would have been involved in killing them. And so Saul kept hearing the truth over and over, and it was getting under his skin. And he was being more and more desperate to do bad things to people. And now, not only was God causing his conscience to be pricked and having him get the truth again and again, but now God knocks him down and blinds him and gets his attention this way. It's something where he is really being stopped by or arrested by Jesus Christ. And what we get a picture of is that all up until now, Paul has been struggling. Maybe struggling like, you know, a disobedient child having a temper tantrum. Have you seen this where the parents are bringing direction, correction, it gets more and more chaotic and out of control? Or the example, the specific analogy that's used here in the scripture is like an ox who won't budge or won't obey but instead kicks against a sharp stick that is a goad used for prodding. I don't know a lot about prodding oxen, but if I understand correctly, what the man does who's prompting an ox to go somewhere is he gets a stick, and it's very, very sharp with a piece of metal on the end or something like that, and he says to the ox, we're going to go this way, and the ox said, I won't, and he says, you will, and he begins to poke at this thing until it goes. And if the ox says, I won't do that, begins to kick against it and so forth, you know who's going to get hurt? Who? The ox, thank you. Yes, the ox is finding that this is sharper than the usual one, and he might injure himself a few times kicking against this thing, right? And so if that's the case, the Lord says, it's become very hard for you to be kicking against those roads, hasn't it? 
you're not enjoying this very much. I've knocked you to the ground, you're getting blinded and all this. It's getting worse and worse for you. One of our Acts facts here. Goads were used to prod stubborn oxen. God's goads are used to get the attention of stubborn people. Lashing out or resisting God only succeeds in hurting yourself. In every place that I go, I speak with people, and some of them have yielded their lives to Jesus Christ, and they say, whatever you want, I will do. And others are saying, I'm not ready to do that. I don't want to do that. It's too difficult to do that. I'm going to kind of fight back against that. And each time, they make it more and more difficult for themselves. And God finally says, have I gotten your attention yet? Knock it off with kicking against what I'm doing. It's only going to hurt you. And that's what Paul says was happening then. And at last, we come to the third part of our message. And this is the part where it's the, really the centerpiece of his testimony. We've heard about before the salvation. And now, what happened when Jesus really captured him, starting at verse 15. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? He had heard this voice. And this voice, seemingly from God, was saying... This is what you're doing. Now knock it off. And he said, who are you? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Was that what he expected to see? Had he thought that this was a false imposter, somebody was dead, this was creating some kind of a weird cult, he got to get rid of all these people. And then the next thing he knows, the voice of God from heaven says, it's me, Jesus, and I'm talking to you. That was a surprise to him. Now, Jesus takes over as Lord. Instead of Paul oppressing Jesus' people, Jesus now says, I'm in charge here. I'm going to tell you what you're going to do from now on. First of all, get up. Get on your feet. I'm appointing you. You're now my servant, and you are my witness. And you must tell others what I show you. And as it says in these next verses, you're going to be opposed by the Jews but I will rescue you. You're going to be opposed by the Gentiles, but I will rescue you. I'm in fact sending you to those Gentiles to open their eyes, and your job is to turn them from darkness to light, turn them from the power of Satan to the power of God, tell the Gentiles that they may receive forgiveness for their sins, tell them that they may have a place among those who are saved and who are right with God. Now, I'm sure that Paul had heard this message of the gospel in some ways before. Listen now, he had been torturing Christians, asking them what their deal was, interrogating them, and so on, and they would have told him things in the past. They would have told him that, of course, we all are sinners, and we need to have our sin removed. They would have told him that. They would have told him that Jesus died to pay for our sin and to be the punishment, the sacrifice for our sin. They would have told him that. They would have told him that we must believe in Jesus and receive Jesus as Savior. He would have known that. But until this moment, until now, he rejected this. He struggled against this. Now at last, he believes it, receives it, and submits his life to Jesus Christ. It was a remarkable day, and a day that set the example for millions of people who have come behind, because people will say, you know, I was resisting God. And I was struggling against God. And then finally the moment came where, like the Apostle Paul, I quit fighting against it and I said, I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life. This is not just an historical thing that happened once to Paul. It is historical, but it's not only that. It's an example for you and me. There are people, even in this room, that the Lord may be saying, young people, and in some cases some very much older people, where the Lord may be saying, You've been resisting me. You've been going your own direction on this thing for years. Are you ready to stop kicking against me and instead go my way? Some of you may even say, well, I've been fairly religious. I want to tell you, Paul had been fairly religious up to this moment, hadn't he? He'd been super religious. But he didn't belong to Jesus Christ. And so the Lord would say to you, are you done resisting me and ready to receive me as your Savior and put me as the Lord of your life? That's what happened to Paul then. 
I pray that would be happening for you as well. We've heard something about captured by Jesus. We have a picture again of Paul having that interaction with the Lord on the road to Damascus. What comes next, starting at verse 19, is a changed life. And so then, Paul says, again, addressing King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision that came from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and Judea, and finally to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. Paul says, I started out small, right where I was in Damascus, and then I went on to Jerusalem, and then I went throughout the Jewish lands of Judea, and then I started into the Gentile lands all over the empire. I did what Jesus told me to do. Paul told his audiences everywhere to repent and return to God. He told religious people, like he had been, to repent and return to God. Many of them had a structure of religion, but they didn't have salvation. Did this message go over well? Well, with some people it did, people were saved. With other people, they rejected it, and they tried to do bad things to Paul, even. And that's what happened to Paul. He refers to that here. That's why, verse 21, the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. He says, you know, I wasn't universally loved for this message. Uh, some Jewish people tried to murder me, and that's why I'm here in jail right now. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and to great alike. God has helped Paul all the way down to that very time so that he can give his testimony to people who are in the world's eyes the small, that is the young, the poor, those in human need, those who have suffering. He says, I loved to tell about Jesus to those who were in need, those who the world thought were small. And also to the great, the educated, the wealthy, the powerful, the influential. He says, I had the opportunity and privilege to share this with those the world considered the great. I did that too. In fact, all around listening right now, Paul's giving a testimony to a king and a governor and to military commanders and wealthy citizens. You see, Paul took that message that Jesus gave him and he followed Jesus' command and he went out to be a witness of what he saw and did. And I want to tell you this, and I need you to hear this. No Christian will be fulfilled or satisfied unless he is acting as such a witness. Again and again, when I talk to Christians, and some of them are dissatisfied, sort of down as Christians, and feel like they're just, their lives aren't really meaningful to them, sometimes they start looking for other things that might make it more meaningful, and they'll say, well, maybe I'll go to a conference someday. And I'm, I'm in favor of that. Go to all the conferences you need to. But oftentimes they come home, and they don't feel that much more fulfilled than when they went. On the other hand, when they begin sharing about Jesus Christ with others, something happens. And you know it. You know it's true. There's nothing more thrilling than sharing your faith with others, especially when the others say, wow, tell me more. I need to hear more about this. And their lives are being changed. That's part of what Dan over here was telling us this morning. He said, let's find where he's Jesus. Let's be doing what he's doing. The Bible says that Jesus is seeking to save the lost. Well, since I know what he's doing, and if I join him in that, well, then I'll be closer to him. Dan said, here's one opportunity. Let's go to the pumpkin festival and share about Jesus. The Bible says that Paul picked this up, and he made sharing his testimony, sharing his faith with others, a normal and natural part of what he did, and in so doing, he felt close to the Lord. I'm going to give you an Acts fact. Paul and the early church believed that sharing their testimony was simple obedience to Jesus Christ. To hold back would be disobedience. They knew that no person is too small to receive the gospel, nor is any person too great to receive the gospel. Paul was willing to share this with people who were then slaves and people who were dying, and he was willing to share it with kings and eventually Caesars. Do you get where I'm going with this? And Paul says, this is what God created me to do. This is the commission he gave to us. And it wasn't just for one Christian here, one Christian there. The early church believed, that's what we're all here for. We're going to do this. We move on to verse 22. Paul says, I've had God's help to this very day. I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer, 
and is the first to rise from the dead to proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Paul says, everything I'm telling everyone here agrees with the prophets, agrees with Moses. My message is simply this, that Christ would suffer crucifixion. That's what the prophets indicated, and that's what I believe, that Christ would rise from the dead, that Christ's resurrection assures that we will be resurrected because he was the first, and we will follow after that if we know him, that Christ is alive for the benefit of the Jews, that Christ is alive for the benefit of the Gentiles. I believe all of this. And Paul is speaking, now listen now, specifically about Jesus dying and rising again and changing people's lives now. And Paul is declaring all of this, and this brings us to the big climactic finish of this whole message, the two typical reactions that come next. And the first one is really amazing. At this point, verse 24, Festus, the governor, interrupted Paul and shouted, You're out of your mind, Paul! Your great learning is driving you insane! He says. Paul is obviously a great scholar, a brilliant man, easily the most educated man in that room. I mentioned all the kings and governors and all of that. Paul had more languages, more training, more background of education than all of them. And yet, here comes Festus, and he pops out of his seat and says, stop it, stop it, stop, 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 stop. This whole thing is insane. It's crazy. How could you believe this crazy stuff about someone dying and coming alive again? For all of your great education... You are making no sense. I don't believe it. This is crazy talk. This is one typical reaction to the Christian testimony or the Christian gospel. I need to say, lay this out a little more. Someone would say, how can a smart person like you believe that it was God who created the world instead of just happening by evolutionary chance, the word that we all know is true? Do you really believe this when you're, you're in college? An educated person believing that? That's just crazy. How can you believe that these miracles recorded in the Bible, these things that Jesus did, are really true and are real? Do you believe that Jesus really is a person and was God at the same time and born miraculously and lived as God? You don't believe that. That Jesus died and rose from the dead? That's what is a sticking point for our friend Festus here, when I went to the University of Michigan, I had a very erudite professor who explained to us that, of course, tonight wasn't the true thing that Jesus died and rose from the dead, that it was part of a springtime fertility myth, and that in springtime, people think about things coming to life, and that Christians made up a story that Jesus came to life, and that that's what that was, and we can all understand it that way. Do you understand this? You can't be a smart person at the University of Michigan and believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. It's crazy. Do you really believe that Satan and demons are real and they're enemies and they're doing things in our lives? Do you really believe there's only one way of salvation instead of many ways that we can all find our own way spiritually? Can you really know or believe anything is absolutely true? I remember when a friend of mine went through a graduate level program in economics and mathematics, and he was taught that there is nothing that is absolutely true because if we believe that everything is a random chance, then nothing can be absolutely true. And he was taught that even though 2 plus 2 normally equals 4, there's always a chance that it won't. <laughs> and that on one time that it comes together, it won't equal 4, it'll equal something else. And this is what was being taught in the graduate level school at his university. I said, Mike, are you telling me that someday 2 plus 2 won't equal 4? Well, sometimes. Sometimes. You mean you'd say you're an educated person and you believe that some things are absolutely true, like 2 and 2 equals 4? That's very simplistic. I, I, that, that's actually crazy. It's just crazy. You need to understand that absolute truth and things about what the Bible is saying, it's all just sort of relative in your sense. If you get that straight. But no, you have these crazy ideas. It's insane. Festus rejected the message as being unbelievable or crazy in some way. Will there be people you will run into who will have that reaction? Will there be? Yes, there will. There will be people who will say to you, that isn't true. It can't be true. I reject this. This is not true. When you tell them this message, 
And you will think to yourself, oh, what did they do wrong? I should have done this better. Don't think that way. They've reacted that way all the way back to the Apostle Paul and before that. Do you get this? This is a typical reaction. It's a typical. I'm not going to say it's normal. I'm not going to say it is true, but I'm going to say it's typical. It happens a lot. People say, I reject this because it's just so far removed from my way of thinking. I think it's crazy. I won't listen to it. That's one typical reaction. Paul responds in the following way. Verse 25, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. And then he turns his attention back to King Agrippa, the Jewish man in the room, and says, the king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. All these things about Jesus' life and even his death and resurrection were things that were very public events. The king knows about these things. I can talk to him, and he's at least not going to say, yeah, all miracles are nuts and rising from the dead. Where the king, supposedly, being a Jewish guy, is supposed to believe these things. And so Paul directs this. Now, listen now. Festus has already said, I reject this. But Paul looks right at King, Agri king Agrippa and says to him, King Agrippa, verse 27, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. This is similar to saying, you believe the Bible, don't you? You believe that what the prophets wrote and what the Old Testament says is true, don't you? He answers the idea being, if we can agree that the Bible is our authority and it's a good starting point for a conversation about God, if we can agree that those things are true, then we've got something we can talk further about. Agrippa sees where this is going. If he admits that he believes the Bible, that he believes the prophets, then he's going to have to respond to the Bible's claims and in some way give his own life to God. And so his reaction is this. He says, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? This is another typical reaction. It's not the you're crazy reaction. It's the, yeah, it might be true, but I'm not ready to accept it yet reaction. Did everyone get that? How often have you talked to somebody and said, this is what Christ has done in my life, and this is what he's attempting to do for our world. And they say, yeah, I probably should go that way, or it might be true, but, you know, I'm not ready for that just yet. I'm not going to believe that right now, maybe later. I need to think about it more. This isn't a good time for me. That might be great for you, but I'm not sure it's true for me. I don't want to feel pressured, not so quick about this. Maybe another time. In one translation the way that it comes out, this is the King James Version, and then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. It's too quick for me right now. I can't do it this fast. I'll get there another time. Almost. Paul's response, of course, in verse 29 is, whether you respond in a short time or in a long time, my prayer is that you and all these people in the room will become as I am, except for these chains. I want all of you to become Christians as I am, and I want all of you to know the power of God in your lives, and I want all of you to have the joy of knowing Jesus. I'm not interested in being prisoners. I mean, we can leave that part out. But the rest of it, he says, except for these chains, I wish all of you were as I am. Paul faces the same kind of responses that I know you've experienced. These things are nothing new. Our Acts fact says this. Some people are like Festus. The gospel is so opposed to their way of thinking that they consider it nonsense or insanity. Others are like Agrippa. They admit it might be true, but they're not ready to give up their current life just yet. Everyone got me on this? These are two typical reactions. At that moment, at that moment, verse 30, the king, King Agrippa, rose. He stood up. Meaning, this interview is over. I'm done hearing about this. So, Governor Felix stood up, and Bernice stood up, and they all left and walked out, and everyone else stood up and walked out too. So far as we know, they never came to faith in Christ. There's no indication that it says later, you know, that guy Paul witnessed to, he later became a believer. There's no indication of that at all. One guy says, this is insane. Somebody else says, no, not yet, maybe another time. Both of them have these typical reactions. We have no reason to understand that either one of them ever came to faith in Christ. I will ask you this. Did Paul fail? 
Should he have been more forceful? Should he have been more subtle? Should he have been more academic? Maybe more emotional? Maybe more gifted? You know, this is typical. This is typical. People share their faith with somebody, and they don't get a good reaction to that. And then Satan beats them up the whole way home. He says, if only you'd said something different. If you'd been a little bit less this way, and a little more that way, and so on and so on. As if you were just getting it just the right way was the thing that needed to happen. Is that true? It's true that Satan will beat you up that way. Is it true that you should have been just a little more something else? No. I doubt it. I doubt it. In fact, I know so many people who think, well, since it wasn't successful, maybe the best thing to do is to just stop witnessing. Just stop sharing my testimony. I obviously am no good at this. It's going to get rejected. It will be by many. Was the Apostle Paul rejected? Was he rebuffed? Yes. Did he stop telling others? Did he? Thank you, John. No, did he, during his lifetime, did he continue to share with others? During his lifetime, he continued to share with others his testimony and what God had for him. That was his life's mission. He continued to do this, even if people would reject and rebuff this. I know of many people who say, well, if only we would all be more like this in how we share the gospel, or if only we would all do it different in some way, and I would say, my main interest isn't that you do it at all. I, there's an old story that I like about uh, Dwight Moody, the great evangelist. And one day a lady came to Dwight Moody and said, Mr. Moody, she said, I don't approve of the way you do evangelism. And he says, why, dear lady, there's many things that I do that I think are probably inferior, and I must agree with you. Tell me, what method of evangelism do you use? And she said, well, I don't do evangelism. He said, well, then, in that case, I like the way I do evangelism better than the way you don't do evangelism, he said. And I'm, I'm with Moody on this. I like the way people do evangelism better than the way that others don't do evangelism. Share your faith. Tell people what Christ has done for you. Don't feel as though you need to get wrapped up with things you don't know about. The main thing you do know about is what Jesus has done in your life. Isn't that right? Nobody is an expert on what Jesus has done in your life the way that you are. You may not be an expert at anything else in the whole world, but you're an expert at what Jesus did in your life. Tell other people that. That is the testimony you have. Use that testimony. Tell other people, this is what he's done in my life. Tell them often. Expect that many of people will say, you're crazy. And others will say, oh, I couldn't do that yet. No, 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 no. But some will say, thank you. I needed that. And some will be saved. And whether they re reject it or accept it, you will have a power from God where God will say, I'm now moving in your life in a wonderful way because you are sharing Jesus Christ with others. It is a tremendous thing. Well, we come near the end of our message, and I do have this last Acts fact. Christians are commanded by God to share their faith with others. You have not failed if the message is rejected. Paul was rebuffed too. But you have failed if you never share. Coming to verse 31. King Agrippa, Governor Festus, leave the room. They conferred just out in the cloak room on the other side, just outside the room. They left. And while they were talking to one another, they said, well, this man's not doing anything. He deserves death or imprisonment. Having gone through all that again, they said, well, he may be a nut, but he hasn't done anything that deserves imprisonment or execution. I don't see anything like that. And Agrippa says... This man could have been set free if he'd not appealed to Caesar. Now, we understand that from two years ago. He should have been set free, but there's political concern. If we let him get free, well, then the Jews would be angry and all this stuff. And Agrippa, newly arriving on the scene, said, I don't know why he's been in jail all this time. He hasn't done anything wrong. The implication, I need to share with you two implications about this as we finish. One of them is the Christian faith should not receive any government opposition. There's nothing wrong with it. The people who would read this book of Acts later during the next centuries when the Romans were persecuting Christians would look at this and say, from the very beginning, Christians have been doing what's been right, not what's been wrong. There shouldn't be any opposition to Christian government. And that's something that is an implication of this. Out of the words of this king, he's not doing anything to deserve any punishment at all. But on the other hand, another implication is this. He shouldn't be held over. There shouldn't be any further imprisonment. We shouldn't have to even be sending him off to Rome, but we are. Because it's God's will for Paul to go to Rome. It's God's
God's will for Paul to preach to Caesar Nero. And I think Daniel adequately pointed this out as well. If Paul had gone, if he had, you know, purchased a ticket on a cruise ship to go to Rome and got off there and knocked on Nero's door and said, here I am at the palace, I'm here to preach the gospel to you, they wouldn't have let him in. But now he must go there, and Nero must hear. This is God's will. It's God's will for him to go. No mistakes here. Paul did nothing wrong, but God wills for him to go. And so, when we get to our next chapter, we're going to get to what may be the most exciting chapter in the entire book of Acts. It's a chapter that um, no one will fall asleep with. And we're going to be tackling chapter 27 involving... Paul's journey to Rome and all of what happens along the way. I'm looking forward to being with you about that next week. And then after that, two weeks from now, the final chapter from the book of Acts. I wonder if all of you would stand with me right now.